this works. So I used to tell people, I, I used to be a very good pediatrician, then I became an okay epidemiologist, and I'm now I'm kind of a so-so medical affairs guy. Um, so maybe just we'll start with um, maybe my presentation. Let me see. <laughs> Can we get the slides, please? So um, Angus said, don't be too conceptual. Make sure you put some, some numbers in to the presentation. So, um, so I tried to put some numbers in. That's it. Next, yep. Come on up. So, so I put some numbers in this slide. So a lot of things happen on the internet. So we're going to talk about big data over the next 10, 15 minutes. And so by the end of my talk, six million, well, we'll go back, six million tweets will have been tweeted. 48 million Google searches will have been searched. Two billion emails will have been sent, hopefully not too many from this room. <laughs> and at the same time, 48 people will not have died from a vaccine preventable disease. Yet, 28 more vaccine preventable deaths could have been prevented through better vaccination coverage. So what we're really talking about is the fact that we can have great vaccines, right? But the effectiveness of a great vaccine that doesn't reach anybody is zero. So we've spent a lot of time working on developing new vaccines, which is great. We need to continue to do that. But I think as, you, and I'm preaching to the choir here, but really focusing with the same kind of uh, approach to how we work on vaccine coverage uh, is critical. So why do we turn to big data? So, so what are we actually even talking about when we talk about big data? Disclaimer, I am not a data scientist, um, so I will not go into the technical details, but, won't, but we are literally swimming in data, right? So everything that we're, that we're wearing, the, the pocket computers that we keep in our pockets, some people call them phones, right? Everything, we're generating so much data all the time. Apparently, 90% of the data in the world were generated in the last two years. Think about that, right? And this is not gonna slow down, it's only gonna get faster. But data is not information. So how do we turn this into information? So we ta often talk about the four V's of big data. And what do we mean? So obviously the big part is the volume, right? There's just so much of it. How do we, how do we incorporate it? We need new techniques, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning to be able to make sense of it. There's also variety, different sources of data. So those of us who've traditionally worked use, you know, doing biostatistics work with very structured data. We have the techniques that we, that we know how to do that, but the data need to be, you know, how much time is spent actually doing data management versus the analysis, right? It's like 90% of your time is just setting up the data so you can work with it. Now imagine trying to work with not just tables, but also images and sounds and streaming data, right? And so we also have the velocity. It's coming in at a rapid clip. So if you think about things like wearables, you can now actually get streaming information that's going directly into the databases to be able to pick this up. So how do you incorporate, how do you deal with that? And of course, there's the issue of veracity. We have to make sure that we're using good data because if you have garbage in, you'll get garbage out. But we know that there's also a lot of missing data and so there are also the techniques to be able to look at how do you impute for where there's data missing to be able to make sense of this in this very kind of uncertain uh, uh, set of data. So uh, hopefully I'll go the right direction now. Yeah, so talked about why big data. So why are we looking at flu and diabetes? Well, in a nutshell, if you have diabetes and you get influenza, it can make your e influenza episode worse but it can also make your diabetes worse. So we know that with an influenza episode, 
you can have decompensation of people, whether it leads to diabetic ketoacidosis, um, changes in their diabetic uh, medication control, changes in their glycemic control, and then also have higher risk for complications. So three to six time increased risk of hospitalization and deaths in someone who's got diabetes compared to someone who doesn't. S so despite the fact that people with diabetes are in considered to be in the risk groups in most countries for people who should get an influenza vaccination, many people with diabetes are still not getting vaccinated. So the question is why? So what we wanted to do is take w is to see how we can harness big data, take new approaches using either new uses for existing data, new data sources, and new approaches to try to understand what these factors are. Right? And so I think we talked a lot already today about the fact that there are attitudes that can be part of it, but, it's but we know it's not just about attitudes. It can also be around things like uh, affordability and access. <laughs> so the first thing we did is we started to make sure that we don't repeat what we already know. So working with a company called Dr. Evidence, where they have the ability to take literature from the uh, from you know PubMed from published literature, but also gray literature, abstracts, PhD theses, etc., and to be able to ingest it using natural language processing, put it into a massive database in a structured way to be able to actually start to analyze this, and then using algorithms to s to be able to look at the questions that we want to do. So essentially, it's like doing an, a meta analysis, but in a way that enables you to have access to a much larger body of data very quickly, and actually look at the at this and so we've con you know, confirmed what we already believe in terms of s risk factors for flu in people with diabetes. The second is also starting to understand what are some of the behavioral phenotypes and so Luca is going to talk about this next so I won't go into detail but to w in order to be able to think about what could be those individual level, level factors that could have an impact on the, on the intervention that we have. And the third is what I'll go into is the project we did with Google, which is to build a data mart, so basically a space on the cloud, where we could bring together a variety of different data sources, including use and then be able to use their analytical tools to be able to take the outcome of interest, people's, uh, you know, whether people got vaccinated or not, and actually go backwards and let the data help us understand what those factors can be. So, so we did this. And we wanted to, and we went in, to be honest, not knowing exactly what we were going to get at the end. So we also, as much as what we did, I think it was also very important how we did this. So we did this over a three-month period, which is ex very short, at least for us <laughs> in, in the, the work that we do, uh, working with the Google engineers on a weekly basis, doing what they call the design sprint. So it's how software is often developed and everybody would get on a call for one hour and we would present, they would present the new information they had, the new work that they had done. They had no background in healthcare. And so they were going through the data and they would come back and we'd say, they would say, does this make sense? And we would look at it and say, well, could you go back and look at it this way? And it was through this iterative approach that we were able to um, get to where we did after three months. And I think for, s for those of us coming from a scientific background where everything is you set up an experiment, you design it, and you run the protocol, and you press go, and you let the whole thing run, this is a different approach. And I'm not saying that, that it's going to replace the, the experimental method, but it's for, for designing an approach like this, it's really important. Okay, so what did we do? So we started with um, Vaxi Trends, which was a survey that was done a number of years ago with, what, about 12,000 individuals, Angus? something like this, looking at um, in terms of attitudes, perceptions, or barriers and factors associated with vaccination in six different countries. We combine this with other data, so we use the National Health Interview Survey from the US CDC, uh, and then we used search data that, that Google was able to access, so anonymized search data in the same population. So in this case, we looked at the US to be able to offer, to get insights in terms of, and restricting it to individuals with diabetes to try to understand what the factors were that made someone mu more or less likely to be vaccinated for, against influenza. So we aggregated this, including uh, other data. So they incorporated Google flu trends to look at trends over time and also regional differences. Uh, we're also, we're now looking at incorporating social media data. So uh, there's a, uh, 
uh, data set from Twitter that's being overlaid this to provide additional uh, insights. And then th what the, the team did was to use machine learning to create clusters. So in fact, when you see the results, you'll say, okay, well, we knew that. But it was trying to get into another level of detail to see if we could go down at a more granular level, for example, at the level of a state or even the re within a state. Um, but then also get a sense of how, does it, how do we actually quantify these. So let me go into that and it'll hopefully make a little bit more sense. So as you can see, when you look across the countries, the, the drivers are barriers, so the drivers positively associated in green, barriers in red, are going to be different from one country to another. So you know, in this audience, I'm sure this is not a surprise that the context is going to be different, but it, what, what we're doing is going from a one-size-fits-all approach to understanding this public health issue to a more personalized approach, right? So in the past, if we wanted to have a public health prevention intervention, it might be the poster that goes on the waiting room wall, and we know that that is not going to be sufficient to address everybody's concern because it may be for one person that they are f fearful of a vaccine, maybe for another person that they just just didn't, literally didn't get around to it. Their life is too disorganized, they're busy, they wanted it, they have no issue with safety, they have no concern that, that they're, you know, that they want to be protected, but they just couldn't get themselves vaccinated. And so by being able to look at this on a more granular level, it, it leads us to be able to think about what insights that we can use to then design interventions or guide policy that could address these at a more individualized level. So in addition to have so when we so we had the information from the survey by combining it with the Google search data and being able to look we could see that the that the factors were not evenly distributed over space so for example if you look at you know clusters within uh you know different uh states within the within the US that we knew that there you know when you look at the relationship between the propensity of getting vaccinated, different factors are going to have different uh, weights, right? So they're not going to be correlated in exactly the same way, right? And so we can do this looking for both the, the drivers and the barriers. But, what w um, but again, we wanted to not do this just to have better insights. We want to actually be able to do this so that th we could uh, act. So we um, so these data were actually presented at a diabetes meeting. And so I think one of the key takeaways for us was that, you know, we often talk within the vaccine world, right? And in fact, we brought these data to diabetologists who are seeing the patients with diabetes who up until now, well, I'm not saying that we, we, we open their eyes to flu, but most of them are not thinking about influenza and influenza vaccination in their practices. Yet they're the ones who are often seeing diabetic patients, some may also be primary care physicians. But when we showed them the, the data, they were actually, they were quite fascinated. And so the, by, by getting it out there to them, we were able to raise their awareness and, and realize that this is another thing that they can use to, to engage with their patients. And so they were very excited about this. But we also didn't just want to leave it at the level of a scientific meeting and a publication. We actually wanted to do something that could be used ideally at a country level. And so this is a, a prototype um, and we're still working on it. But the idea is to say, okay, if we can cluster all of these factors and be able to understand in a given population or in a given location or people who have a certain profile, what is the relative impact of these different factors such that we have an idea from a prioritization standpoint which are the most likely to actually have an influence to change people's pr likelihood of getting vaccinated. So in other words, if you were to go to a region within the US, or if you were able to take these data and go someplace else, and what's exciting about this is that the engineers from Google said, because there's so much data from the Google search, they actually think that they can replicate this just using the Google search data in a country, even without the underlying survey data. So if you think about that, we had data from the UK, China, um, you know, Mexico, US, et cetera, but to be able to go into another country, in Romania or Germany, where you can use the Google search data and model the same, use, use modeled on the search data to be able to come up with similar results with about 
accuracy. We still have to test that to see if it's if it holds up, but the idea is that this is something that could be then replicated. But the idea is that if you could then focus on this particular area, right, or a particular population, be able to understand which factors, maybe it's around um, convenience, and it's about knowing where to go to get your flu vaccine, or maybe it's around fear of vaccination, and so that would help, say, an immunization program be able to tailor their messages to focus on the issues that are going to be more relevant within that population as opposed to something that may be less relevant and, and be able to use their, their funds more effectively. So this is something that we really wanted to try to do. Um, so again, this is a prototype. Um, we still have work to do to make sure that we can replicate this in other countries with the Google search data and, and actually see that this is useful. But again, it's about coming up with something that we're actually going to be able to implement. So I guess what I would what I would leave you with here is the fact that you know, and this again coming from someone with a public health background, where we tend to look at the population as a whole. I think to Angie mentioned, you know, pop, you know, how do you reconcile population health and individualism, right? So we, we heard about you know why people are so satisfied with their interactions with a CAM physician is because they feel like an individual, right? They take all the information about their context into consideration when they're, when they're thinking about what, what is necessary for that person. You know, who wouldn't want that, right? Yet, from a public health perspective, we've always taken this one-size-fits-all approach. So, hope what we're, so really what we're trying to do here is do what we expect in all other aspects of our life, right? If I had, you know, in the past, we used to all get the news one way. There was one news, you know, that would be printed in the newspaper, right, not that long ago, and everybody would have exactly the same newspaper, right, more or less, right, so your news was fixed. Now, how do you get your news? How many people get their news on their, on their mobile phone or on their iPad, right? Probably using one or two or three of the same news apps, and yet every single one of you will have a different news feed on your phone. Why? because it's based on your behavior, your stated preferences, other things that you're doing that tailor it to you. Now, this can cause problems, as we've seen, in terms of <laughs> creating a um, kind of an echo chamber. But we expect these kinds of personalization in our day-to-day -day life. So why wouldn't we expect this kind of personalization in our healthcare? And so I think by trying to adopt these new methods, and we are by no means very comfortable. This was you know, kind of awkwardly stumbled our way through it, but we're learning. And I think we all need to learn how to how to at least appreciate and understand where these app where these tools can be applied because we're never going to all be data scientists and expert at machine learning, but we can spot the opportunities where this approach can be leveraged to really make an impact. And I think by personalizing public health, I think is one key way to do that. So I'll stop there and say thank you. <laughs> Thanks.